Um, so there's multiple questions um, from the attendees, but I'll just start with one that's come up a few times, which is in your experience in general, and I think this is hard to uh, perhaps quantify because everyone is so different, but uh, what is the success rate, do you think, of general blood patching for someone with negative imaging? Um, so I would say uh, a couple things. First is there's a difference between epidural patching for a spontaneous CSF leak and epidural patching for a chronic post-puncture leak. Um, for, and, and there is controversy among patients with spontaneous leaks about whether in fact you should be or it is necessary to be offering targeted epidural blood patching versus non-directed epidural blood patching. Um, so I will say this, in my experience, let's talk first about spontaneous leaks. In my experience in spontaneous leaks, it is markedly more successful to be offering targeted epidural blood patching, even when the imaging is negative. And I think a lot of the, the people in the audience might ask, well, how? what do you mean targeted if the imaging is negative? And I think you and I have discussed, uh, Dr. Amuzagar, on a number of occasions, like when you go through the myelogram of someone who has orthostatic headache and uh, in which there is no well-defined epidural collection uh, proving a leak, um, there is often localizing findings. There can be, um, there can be, uh, there can be, I'm seeing my son banging on the door. There can be bone spurs pushing on the dura uh, that can puncture the dura. There can be aneurysmal dilatations of the nerve root called perineural cyst. That can be places where you can develop either a CSF venous fistula or a spontaneous leak. Um, there are often levels where there's much more robust contrast spread along the nerve root. And our experience has been that when you patch at those locations, your success rate goes up significantly. Um, and uh, I would say in terms of success rates, maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent of those get better with one patch, but with repeated patches, uh, that number goes up to 50, 60 percent. And um, and in a subgroup of those people, you can find people in whom you can put two cc's, a very small volume of fibrin glue on the thing you think is leaking, and they'll get better for three, four weeks, and then their symptoms will come back. But then you know that that is the structure that the leak is near because that two cc's does not spread far. And our experience has been that whether those patients undergo surgery at Stanford or go down to see Dr. Shevink at Cedars, a significant proportion of those, not everyone, but maybe 50% get better, which seems to be the rate of recovery after surgery when they think they know where the leak is. 50% of these people who we do surgery on still don't get better where they get better for a little while and their leak recurs, which is disappointing to those people and to me. Um, however, with the chronic postural puncture headaches, I think our rates are better. We know where that leak is. It's always in the lumbar spine. It's, it's most commonly on the dorsal dura. It's an easy place to patch. Um, and uh, I think that the percentage of people who get better from those um, is higher. I think it's I haven't actually gone back and calculated from our own experience, but I would say it's, you know, more like the 60, 75 percent, often requiring glue, um, but not always. Like the patient that I showed uh, with the hip surgery, uh, she only required two blood patches, and that was 14 months after the dural puncture was done. And now she comes back and she sees me to ask advice about, like, do I need to do something different as I start to get pregnant? Um, and this kind of thing. She's living her life. So um, I think those are really low-hanging fruit. They get better more often, and that'll get your, your colleagues more interested in patching these patients. Um, and uh, I think it is, it is the group for which the leap from where we are to where we need to be is the smallest, if you know what I mean. Right. That's great. Thank you. Uh, there's also a question about what kind of needle you would recommend for diagnostic LPs. Would it be similar as well, where you would recommend, for example, the Whitaker uh, over the Quinky? Yeah, I think it's any one of those atraumatic needles, uh, a Whitaker, or there's, there's one prospective study out there that looked at 
um, Sprott needles versus Whitaker needles versus Quinky needles. And um, the difference between Sprott and Whitaker needles, both of which are atraumatic, both of, so let me take a step back, both of the atraumatic needles were much better than the Quinky needle, the cutting needle, which is most common. Um, but between those two needles, um, the rate of getting a chronic post, or excuse me, the rate of having a postural puncture headache acutely was almost half as low in the Sprott group for reasons that are not obvious to me, and I don't think anyone else has well well explained. Um, it was it was not statistically significant. The p value was like 0 0.08, but it was very nearly statistically significant, and it was a large clinical effect. Um, and so I think the Sprott needles right now are more are likely to be, in fact, based on existing evidence, are likely to be superior to Whitaker needles, but either one is markedly and definitely superior to the Quinky needles. That's great, thank you. And I and I and the Gertie marks are also uh, atraumatic. I know the Gertie marks are are used preferentially at Duke, and I think that's a very reasonable option. That's great. There's there's many questions and many people thanking you for your wonderful presentation and previous videos as well. So just want to pass that on. But uh, I think we have time for one more question, which is, and this has come up uh, already a little bit, doc, Dr. Gray spoke about this a little bit earlier today, but also just to get your thoughts on um, recommendations for patching EDS patients. And there's a lot of physicians that are reluctant to do so for fear of causing worsening of symptoms or potential damage. And what are your thoughts about that? And what would you recommend? <laughs> this question has come up and, and it's interesting. Um, it reminds me when I used to, I started off in internal medicine and uh, it was at a time when beta blockers were being strongly advocated in, um, in patients who were undergoing uh, myocardial infarctions, in which, which is a funny thing because when somebody's having a heart attack, which is what a myocardial infarction is, you're always afraid to give a beta blocker for fear that you're gonna impair their already impaired cardiac function. And yet the data out there shows that it's those patients who in fact benefit from, uh, it's the patients that you're really scared to give the, the beta blockers to who in fact have the greatest survival benefit from them. It's I think analogous uh, with this question about EDS. We know that it is the hereditary disorders of connective tissue that predispose people to developing CSF leaks. I don't know if the other speakers have covered this, Beyond EDS and Marfan syndrome and Lowy Dietz, there are now more than 28 known alleles of other conditions that uh, don't all have uh, specific names, but for whom there are genetic alleles that are associated with uh, disorders of connective tissue and phenotypes most often associated with aortic um, problems. But um, these are the patients who develop leaks and um, uh, the people with leaks, there is really, there is no well-defined helpful treatment except patching. You can't not patch the people who have uh, the leaks and who are predisposed to the leaks. Does it make sense to do it carefully? Yes. But there's no evidence that, let me, let me think about this clearly as I say it. Um, there is every reason to believe an accidental dural puncture in someone with Ehlers-Danlos or another hereditary disorder of connective tissue is going to lead to a, a problem and potentially a chronic problem. But there's no reason to think that somebody with EDS um, is less likely to uh, benefit from a patch than somebody who does not have EDS. The, there is every reason to believe that if you have a chronic leak, that you may have trouble recovering after a patch because some of these leaks are not sealable with patching. Sometimes you can develop an actual fistula, um, which is a kind of epithelialized healed hole in the dura. But um, let me say definitively, I think that uh, my assumption is everybody who I see who has a spontaneous leak, I just assume has something wrong with their connective tissue, whether it's defined or undefined. And um, and that's no reason to not patch them. And we achieve success in two thirds of those people despite that. Um, our own looking at our own data, which we're having a manuscript now, um, two thirds 
of the people who have orthostatic headache and other symptoms of leak, for every one who had positive imaging, we found five others with exactly the same symptoms who did not have positive imaging. In both groups, those with positive imaging and non-positive imaging, um, something like 60% had clinically meaningful improvements in HIT-6 score, and uh, which is a headache measure, and quality of life measures, um, which was a statistically significant improvement, as well as being clinically meaningful. And there was no difference in the rate of having clinically meaningful improvement on whether you, your imaging was read as positive or negative, which is, I think, kind of stunning. Um, but yeah, we, we need to be offering these patients patches. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so there's plenty of other questions, but uh, for time purposes, I think we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Shivink. And Dr. Carroll, if you're able to stay on for the final panel discussion at the end, hopefully some of the patients that weren't uh, responded to in terms of their questions can ask their questions at that time. Absolutely. Thank you very much.